Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's, and it's great to worship with you today. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. reading from 2 Samuel. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentations for him. When the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of its meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was right, greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah and if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? 
You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of the Lord. Please turn in your bulletin to find Psalm 51. <coughs> Let us recite it in unison. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my weakness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak, and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me, and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and study with the Lord of Spirit. reading from the book of Ephesians. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us has, was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he has also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ, we must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown apart by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, 
we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together in every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. The word of the Lord.
the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the things that is valuable to all of us, particularly as Episcopalians, is the role of tradition in our church. The scripture, reason, and tradition. And that tradition is based on a lot of memories. It's memories of things that have occurred to us and have occurred to our ancestors down through the centuries. And you see it in the Bible because those were oral stories and they were usually memories of what people had uh, over the ages. Those memories oftentimes reflect change that's occurred. Have you ever heard the saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same? How about the only thing constant in life is change? A derivative of that is the only things for sure in life are death, taxes, and change. Because we look at life in short snippets of time, we tend to see lots of change. But there are very few examples of fundamental change that has impacted how human beings relate to one another. And they happen over a long period of time. Now don't get me wrong, I like many of you like to look back and see how the world has changed around me. And I wish for the good old days, those days gone by. But those days are gone. And we're living the good old days of tomorrow, today. So enjoy them while you can. To create that new future, we have to focus on today, but also on tomorrow, because we create those memories in the present. I suspect in years to come, we'll be looking back on this time and saying, you remember when we were in that pandemic and those things that we did, like wearing masks and then not wearing masks and then wearing masks again? Well, those are creating memories. Some things don't change, however, like our need for water and food and shelter and clothing, just to survive. This will be few, true forever, as long as there are human beings on the earth. And when we don't have access to those fundamental things, our behavior does change. If you look around the world at other parts of the world where they don't have enough food, water, shelter, and clothing, behavior there is different. And we can revert to that as well when we don't have those things. This was described in Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs back in 1943. However, the phenomenon's been here long before that and long before Maslow took pen to paper. In our gospel reading from John today, we hear a bit of a, an example of this. Jesus has just finished feeding 5,000 and has gone quietly and undetected across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum and away from those that he fed. And they search him out and they find him. He recognizes that they are coming not because of signs from God, but because they're hungry or they will be shortly. They see Jesus, not as God, but as a source of food. And Jesus tells them, as he so often does in John's gospel, with one of his I am statements, I am the bread of life. Yet they fail to recognize Jesus as their direct connection to God. He's the source of more than food to satisfy their hunger. They don't recognize that God that provided manna from heaven to their ancestors as they came out of Egypt into the wilderness, that this is the same God and he's present right there among them. He goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In the gospel according to Matthew chapter four, Jesus said, it is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The scholars of the Torah recognize this actually coming from the book of Deuteronomy. 
In other words, satisfying our physical needs is necessary for survival, but as human beings, our needs go beyond this. They go beyond mere survival. We have emotional and spiritual needs as well. And we're commanded to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's only by doing these things that we can experience more than physical survival in this world. Survival can take the form of many things, not just food and water and shelter. When something that we value greatly is threatened, it becomes a matter of survival and it can impact our behavior. Now I've heard from a number of people here, and I've probably said it myself, that I'm very concerned about the survival of St. Paul's because the church means a great deal to all of us. St. Paul's, for many of you, is the source of many of your good old days, memories and traditions passed down from generation to generation. And no one wants to give this up. And we don't have to. However, just as you and those that came before you created memories, your call to create new memories. New memories for the next generation. You don't have to give up the old memories, those valuable things. However, be careful not to let those memories get in the way or limit your ability to create new and different memories for that next generation. And every generation before us has done the same thing. They've created new memories for the next generation. Change occurs in small steps, and often it's impossible to sense the underlying fundamental changes that can and do threaten survival if you don't recognize and adjust along the way. Have you ever wondered why so many urban or downtown churches, or even some rural churches, have been so successful bringing people into a relationship with God with food ministries? We've done that here. And yet other churches have failed doing the exact same thing. Those churches that are successful have taken the time to understand the communities that they're in and what their needs are. And then they've responded to those needs. And that's allowed them to survive. And a forward-thinking church not only recognizes what those needs are now, but they're thinking about what the needs are going to be in five years and in ten years. Today they need food. In five years they may need clothing. In ten years they may need different types of shelter. These are changing needs and changing opportunities, and they require us to change with them, creating new memories. By meeting the changing needs of others and giving God the credit, and that's the key. We're not seeking credit. We're giving credit to God where it's due. You become an integral part of the Jesus movement that our present presiding Bishop Michael Curry likes to speak about and refers to often. And in doing so, you become God's love in the world. As Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. God will be using us to provide more than just physical survival to others. We will be sharing the many different gifts that God has given us in grace, in forgiveness, in patience, hospitality, and in humility for the greater glory of God. When you meet basic physical needs, you have an opportunity to meet spiritual needs at the same time. This is what Jesus was doing by feeding the 5,000. But note, he didn't convert all 5,000 at once. It took time and patience, and it took a group of disciples like ourselves, doing God's work 
for them to be brought into a relationship with God. In doing so, you will be using your unique gifts given to you by God to love your neighbor. I invite you to become a beacon, a beacon of hope for God's family within the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement and in our community. I invite you to create new memories for the next generation by meeting the physical and spiritual needs of our own members and of those in a broader community in new and different ways. Over the next few months, we'll be initiating some programs, actually starting in a couple of weeks. And they're not necessarily new or unique, but coming out of a period of COVID, there are going to be some things that we haven't done in a year or a year and a half. Things like blessing the backpacks next Sunday for those people that work in education. We'll be doing Sunday school for all ages starting on the 15th. And we'll be having a confirmation class that we haven't been able to have in almost two years. And these are just some simple examples that will create memories for all those that are involved and will become the good old days for the decades to come. I encourage all of you to participate in one or more of these events over the next few months, and you'll be creating the future of St. Paul's today. In his holy name, amen. of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Bishop Frank, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask for your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers 
for Mary, Pat, Carmela, Madge, Anne, Kara, Jack, David, Bud, Jim, Mary, Andrew, Anne, Lee, Martha, Mary Lynn, Cindy, Wright, Chip, Elizabeth, Charles, and the McLean family. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us, and all will turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O love of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we have no repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk on your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Good morning again. Um, I see everybody got the notice that we're starting at 10 o'clock. That's good. Um, this week, uh, today, will be the last week that we have the uh, Sunday session at 5 o'clock uh, where we've been looking at the history of Christianity. And today we're going to cover some of the um, de denominations that are present primarily in South Georgia. Things like Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, and uh, the AME Church. Just to get a sense of uh, who they are and how they differ from us. But today will be the last week that we do that particular service or that particular class. Uh, starting on the 15th, I'll remind you we'll be going back to having Sunday school for all ages. And it'll be after the 10 o'clock service. We'll also be starting confirmation classes for all those that want to be confirmed or that might want to be received into the Episcopal Church. When the bishop comes on October the 24th, and on that day we'll be having confirmation and receptions, but we'll also be celebrating the 125th anniversary of worshiping in this space, in this church building. So that'll be a, a big day. There's a couple of other dates that are not on your calendar yet that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention. The first is on October 3rd, we're planning to have a bit of a celebration to celebrate uh, the ministry that Father Reed Freeman and his wife had when they were here. They left in the middle of COVID and we were not able to give them a proper send off. So we plan to have a reception for them on October 3rd, that's a Sunday. And the following Sunday, October the 10th, weather permitting, we'll be doing the blessing of animals or blessing of pets like we did last year, and we'll be doing that outside at the 10 o'clock service. 
So you might want to make a note of those dates in your calendars and hopefully you'll show up for those. It'll be a lot of fun. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God. Oh, before we start, sorry. Communion today, we will not be offering the common cup. We will be offering wine, however, in the small little individual cups. So that's the only way that you will be able to receive wine. So come up and I'll give you the wafer and you can go to either side and get one of the small cups or you can choose not to take one. The choice is yours. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God.
Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you've made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ has risen. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be to your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of you and the unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth. 
gifts of God to the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gift of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have banished the spiritual freedom and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world of peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.